we can start. All right, so the topic today is one um, of those who announced, I, uh, that I announced uh, in my uh, tentative plan. And uh, it's somehow the most advanced topic of the lectures. And it's one of my favorite topics in, in, in some sense. Um, so it will be some overall view on the on the uh, quite a big topic, which is the um, duality ADS-CFT in the context of Sasaki-Einstein in the gravity side and n equal one superconformal field theories in four dimensions. And uh, I will uh, well, this can be a lecture course by its own but I can try to condense the main features in, in two hours, in the remaining two hours. So that's our favorite example, ADS-5 process 5. And um, as I mentioned yesterday, one can deform this um, solution and, and the corresponding duality in various ways. So yesterday we focused on keeping the S5 and deforming ADS-5 by adding finite temperature and, and some finite chemical potential, for example. Well, whereas today we will just fix completely ADS5 and uh, deform S5, or rather more precisely replace S5 uh, with um, another compact manifold, um, which I will call Y5 in general. Okay, so that's uh, that's what we are going to do in the in the gravity side. I will. Uh, I will insist in having an ADS-5, and I will also insist in having one quarter supersymmetry, which corresponds to n equal 1 in the, in, the, in, in the field theory dual. So I will start from the gravity side. I will essentially uh, ec t work my way through, fr starting from the equation of motion and imposing the supersymmetry conditions, namely the killing spinner equations. Uh, and then I will explain uh, th this name, what does it mean, and uh, in terms of some properties of these manifolds. And then from that, we will learn various lessons on, on the properties that uh, the geometry is telling us about the field theory. So we'll uh, build up uh, a, a number of important uh, constraints on the, on the dual field theory. So we'll talk a little bit about n equal one supersymmetry uh, in the central part of the discussion today. And hopefully you, you will have seen already that this in the context of the um, Pomonis lectures. And finally, the last part of the, um, of the lecture today and the, the last part of everything in this, in this course will be the application in one particular example that was uh, worked out by Klavano and Witten early on after Mandasena's paper. Okay, so that's, that's the plan. And um, there will be, if there is time, well, I will make sure that there is time, and uh, if I forget, ask me. <laughs> I want to make a little surprise uh, towards the end <laughs> um, for, uh, for those who are interested in this topic. Okay, so um, in the gravity side, uh, we will start from type 2b, which is our choice. We could start in some other supergravity. But we, we choose to start in type 2b, which is where ADS5 causes 5 was found. So we keep type 2b. And also we keep a number of features of the ADS5 causes 5 solution, which is essentially keeping the symmetry um, of ADS5. So if we want to keep the symmetry of ADS5, we better have a matrix which contains ADS5. So the total 10d matrix will be a direct sum. So it will be diagonal in the, in the two factors of an ADS-5 metric in whatever coordinates that you want to choose, plus a metric on the, on the five-dimensional manifold, which uh, at this point I'm, I'm not specifying anything else. And in line with this part of the ansatz, there is also an ansatz for the five-form flux, which uh, we will take to be this factor is chosen with a little bit of uh, um, anticipation on in terms of uh, what has to be choose here. The volume of ADS5 plus the volume of Y5 in such a way that this is already self-dual, so uh, it solves the Einstein equation, sorry, the, the corresponding Maxwell equation automatically. And it's also already self-dual by construction. 
all the other fields, the dilaton, the axion, the other more and more fluxes will be either zero or some constant in the case of the dilaton, for example. And um, so, well, we take this as the ansatz. So this is a choice and this is an, uh, my ansatz. Right, this is zero, all the rest. And then just plug this into the equations of motion, okay? So we have our equations of motion that we worked out some time ago, and we plug in these ansatz. Um, and the ansatz involves remembering that with our standard and universal normalization, which I, I picked throughout the lectures, the radius of ADS5 enters here, and it normalizes the curvature of ADS5. So here, mu nu are indices in uh, ADF, ADS5, whereas I will say ij indices in the internal part. Okay, so this is part of the ansatz. You don't have to recompute it from scratch. We, we knew that already. And once you, you plug this into the equation of motion, then it follows, um, so let's condense everything in this board. It follows that the Ricci tensor of the internal part of the geometry, this, this uh, magic here, has to be equal, and you see something reminiscent of the sphere case, right? So it has to be another space that obeys this equation here. Of course, we know that the sphere obeys that equation, in fact, with the same right A, uh, but more in general, what we learn in just a few steps is that this manifold here has to be, uh, as I said, these are called Einstein manifolds. Right? So that's already, that's already um, an interesting achievement that if we want to do a DSCFT in type 2B, then we can consider any ADS5 times an Einstein manifold and, and that will have uh, in principle a filter, a filter dual. Of course, we are not satisfied completely with that because we also would like our field theory dual to have some supersymmetry. And uh, while S5 had the maximal amount of supersymmetry, we just want to require um, the minimal amount. So then in we also make some part of some uh, minimal ansatz on the, on the spinners and we assume that the, the full spinner of uh, in, in 10D takes a factorized form, which we write this as a tensor product, where this is a spinner in ADS5, and as such we know exactly which equation it obeys, and this is a spinner on Y5, and we don't know yet which equation it obeys, but it is uh, rather straightforward that plug in uh, all that and, uh, and these answers in the spinner, in the killing spinner equation, then it gives us, so uh, from here, we know that uh, d mu of chi is equal to one over two L gamma mu chi. So this equation I wrote in my first lecture, I believe. Um, and then it leads to something which you may almost guess it at this point, if you have a little bit of uh, imagination that there is an equation very similar to this, just with some factor changing. The factor becomes some i instead of a minus. And okay, so this is the equation that we get. Indeed, it looks exactly the same as the equation for ADS5, except there is an i appearing, and this i has to do with the fact that we are in Euclidean signature, whereas here we were in Lorentzian signature. Apart from that, it obeys essentially the same equation with exactly the same radius appearing on, on the two sides. And in fact, uh, uh, it is an exercise that I suggest to, to do something that you have already done, because you, I, I suggested that for, for ADS5, but the same exercise can be done by taking the integrability condition of this equation and checking that this implies that the manifold has to be Einstein. Okay, so this equation here which it's an equation which is valid on a five-dimensional manifold. In fact, it can be written in any odd-dimensional manifold. Uh, 
And uh, the quickest way to, to wrap this up is that we will define such manifolds to be manifolds uh, called Sasaki-Einstein. Okay? So uh, there are some alternative definitions which involve some, some, uh, um, some special properties, some of which I will actually mention. But we can take as basic definition Sasaki-Einstein to be obviously an Einstein manifold plus this equation here. So by definition, Y5 is Sasaki-Einstein manifold. Okay. So let me give uh, some basic properties about Sasaki-Einstein manifold. Remarks, properties, uh, which are useful for the ads correspondence. First, um, so generically, um, there exists one Xi solution to the that equation there, the killing spinner equation, uh, with Xi Dirac Dirac spin. Okay, so uh, a Dirac spinner in five dimension. So generically, of course, because in one particular case, at least at the S5 case, we know that there exists four independent Dirac spinners, which is the maximal amount given in this, in this particular dimension. So the minimal amount is in fact that uh, of uh, having only one, and that is the generic case. You, can't have you, you cannot have cases where you have, for example, two or three. Right? So it's either one or four. So we see that the sphere is a very special case of Sasaki-Einstein manifold. And the other comment is that um, on any Sasaki-Einstein manifold, uh, there exists a, a canonical standard killing vector which in fact can be constructed as a, as a bilinear uh, on the spinner Xi, so the Xi bar gamma mu Xi. This is a vector, which is actually a killing vector. So in, uh, in some coordinates, you can, you can adapt some coordinates to this killing vector, and this will be given by d by d Psi. And then it is also, um, well, quite a well-known fact that once you have such coordinates and you have a killing vector, then the metric takes uh, always can be always put in this form. So here I insert a factor of uh, L for convenience. So uh, the complete dependence on L I put in front. And uh, then the metric on Y5 has to be a four-dimensional metric with some properties which I'm going to specify, and then some uh, deep psi plus sigma square. Okay, so that, that's just the result of um, there being a killing vector. And this is actually a very simple exercise that from that equation follows the disease killing, as I already outlined in my second lecture, I think, for ADS. In addition, there is a bit more one knows a bit more structure about this four-dimensional part of the metric. In fact, uh, this is also an Einstein metric with a slightly different normalization. So the metric here, let's call Ricci 4, because we are now in four dimension, ij is equal to 6 uh, metric for ij. So this is also an Einstein metric. And uh, in fact, uh, it has the property of being uh, a Kähler uh, manifold, but I'm, I don't want to start talking about Kähler manifold or complex manifold, just there's some additional structure. If you know what it means, fine. If you don't, it doesn't matter. What you should know, what is a killing vector, and if you know that, we can, we can get, the, get going. Please ask me questions because I love to answer questions about Sasaki Einstein. 
I, I can hear some. All right. Um, OK, so what did we learn? Uh, to conclude, we can, well, to conclude, say to summarize so far, we have learned that um, a large class of solution to uh, type 2B supergravity are given by ADS5 cross Sasaki Einstein manifold, whose general symmetry is SO2,4 times U1, where U1 is the U1 generated by the scaling vector. Okay. Now, as SO2,4 times SO6 was the isometry, was the uh, corresponding to the superconformer group of n equal 4 superia mills, this symmetry is the uh, super n equal 1 super algebra. Super, um, so this is the, this is. bosonic part, of course. In other words, um, it implies that the dual for the field theory is a superconformal field theory. in four dimensions, yeah, in four dimensions. So n equal one, where n equal ones, n equal one, actually here, this means is also equivalent to n equal or larger than one, right? Because uh, nothing forbids that to be more in principle. Otherwise, uh, I would have killed ADS five process five by, by this. Okay. Mm. What? Um, I don't remember the name of this group. group. It's anyone? Anyone in the audience does? Yeah. It, it, it doesn't matter. Right now, this was in a way kind of surprisingly simple. I mean, of course, I've condensed in, in, a, in a few boards, um, a few couple of years maybe of uh, people working on this. But um, compared to how difficult it is in general to determine what is the field theory dual, this is really easy. So in this story, the harder part is to understand what is the field theory dual. In general, and it's a, mar a remark that maybe I've done to someone, some of you privately, it is much easier, much simpler to start from a supergravity solution and try to identify what is the field theory dual than doing the opposite. I, you take a field theory, which, is, which you know it's super conformal for, for your reasons, and then you're trying to build the, the, the manifold that it's dual to. And uh, the reason is that, um, for example, not all the field theories uh, n equal 1 superconformal field theories will have an ADS5 dual necessarily. And I gave you already some uh, necessary conditions, such as A equal to C, um, that has to, uh, to hold. Okay? So here we, we take this easier route, which is in most cases the only possible route of um, determining the, what is the geometry from the supersymmetry, and then uh, kind of example by example, or classes by example by classes of example, Finding what is the, what are the field theory duals. So the strategy, uh, what is what, what strategy we will take? So the strategy is that of firstly look at n equal one Lagrangian. Luckily, this is very concrete. We don't have to go into the realm of uh, non-Lagrangian uh, field theories and so on, although 
that could be an interesting direction too, but there is a plethora of uh, field theories with n equal one that one can write down with explicit Lagrangian. So we start looking in one of in those cases and then require on top of that uh, conformal invariants. Okay, this is more or less automatic. How this is determined, it requires a little bit of a combination of uh, um, work and uh, art. But how, how do we proceed? We, we proceed trying to extra extrapolate from what was done for ADS5 cross S5, right? So we go back and remember that that duality was formulated by thinking about the three brains and uh, the, the field theory living on the D3 brains and taking a particular near horizon limit and so on. So all of that helped formulating the ADS5 cross S5 conjecture and then we, we, we suspect, and that will be the case, that if you are able to relate uh, this, this solution here, this class of solutions here, to some brain configurations, then uh, we, we are, we are um, in good shape for trying to identify what is the field theory dual. At least we have made uh, considerable progress towards that. Okay, so the ADS, suppose that you were given ADS5 cross S5. I, I know that we, uh, we have uh, explained that in the different order. We started from the D3 brain and I took the near horizon limit and I got ADS5 cross S5. I could have done something similar here, but I wanted to start instead from the solution itself, which, because this is the general case. You, generically, you're given ADS5 or some ADS4, or ADS3 solution, and then the difficult part of the job is to understand what is the field theory, and not always you have the luxury of having some very simple and, and, and straightforward brain configurations for you to, uh, to think about. But in this case, we have something very, very close to being very, very simple. So once, so no, now here I'm trying kind of uh, anticipating what I'm going to do. So once we have a candidate, candidate for uh, the n equal one as CFT, then uh, there is a typical checklist. Okay, typical. Checklist. It's like uh, like the list of the shopping, right? So that when you go shopping, you have a list and you have to check all the items. So what are the items to check? First item to check is the symmetries. Second item to check is the kaluza klein spectra. Uh, first, second, third being in not a particular uh, order, just uh, the, the three main things to do. And uh, three, which uh, I already discussed, is um, anomalies, which also ties in nicely with the Bilal lectures. For example, the vial anomaly, which is then actually ties in with my own lectures. So that is the program. So we tr now we, we implement this strategy, and, uh, and then when we look at the uh, examples, then we, we try to implement this uh, checklist. Any questions? So the next thing we want to do is to think about brain picture, particular D3 brain. How do I know or how do I suspect that there is an underlying D3 brain picture? That's a question for you.
Sorry, I, I, who is saying that? Ah. No, it is not actually a deformation. I use this term, so it's my fault. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, it's really a replacement of, uh, of a theory with another theory or another class of theories. Um, so when, we are, uh, when I'm touching the internal part, uh, it's, it, it, I could be doing something dramatic to the, to the n equal 4, which is the case here. Um, in very special cases, I can think of as a marginal deformations, um, but uh, anyway, let's not open this uh, up. In general, we are changing the theories. Exactly. So that's, that's the most uh, convincing answer. Uh, we have a, a Ramon Ramon 5 form flux. So whatever we have done to this to arrive at this solution, which we are trying to explore and understand, uh, it must come from the tree brain. At least it can only come from the tree brain, if uh, from anything at all, right? not from S5 brain. NS5 brain, for example, or some other brain. So we have that in mind. And um, as I said, having this brain picture is somehow the dream of uh, anyone who is trying to uh, understand uh, the field theory dual of a particular uh, anti deciter solution. Um, but here we will completely fulfill this dream, and in fact, we will be able to find an analytic solution that is actually the solution from which this uh, ADS5 times, S5 times uh, Sasaki Einstein 5 comes in the near horizon. So let's rewrite the usual picture for ADS5 process 5. So here are our large, well, large here is 3, number of the 3 brains. And um, here there is a transverse space. And the transverse space is just flat space, Euclidean R6. And uh, when I did the near horizon, I already observed that R6 is also a cone over S5, which means the following. Well, in pictures, it means this. And in formula, it means that the cone metric, the metric with the symmetries of the cone, has this radial coordinate, which is a, actually a conformal Killing vector. And then it has the five sphere part. Then I wrote the 10 dimensional metric in whatever frame, since the dilatoring is constant. And I really wrote it explicitly in terms of a harmonic function in transverse space. And then uh, a word volume part here I summarize as the flat metric in Minkowski space. And then same function with the opposite power onto this cone. Uh, let's write the cone itself. Since this metric is written there, I can remove it from here. Where H was 1 plus L to the fourth divided by R to the fourth, right? And, and L, to L to the fourth was proportional, and now here I'm going to neglect the proportionality factors, which I carefully derived uh, some time ago, uh, the factor of n. Now, the crucial observation to, uh, to be made here to make the link to the previous discussion is that uh, flat space, as I also observed in my first lecture, is a mani well, it's a non-compact manifold, so it's a it's a variety which, uh, is, if you think in terms of a complex complex variety, like it's like C3, which admits trivially a solution to this uh, most basic killing spinner equation, uh, which I already mentioned in the very first lecture that it's called uh, the equation for special holonomy manifold, right? 
And I also mentioned, but uh, I will excuse you if you don't remember, because I already said it in passing, that in particular in even dimensions or in, in six dimensions, which we are here, uh, then these are called Calabiao manifolds. So R6 is a special case of a non-compact and in fact conical Calabiao manifold. And the key here is to now change chalk with different color and, and just start tweaking various, var various uh, um, expressions. So let's put here the S5. So now uh, what uh, I expect, and then we can check that through, is that instead of S5, that was uh, appearing at S5 plus S5, here I have my Y5 manifold. And instead of, uh, so here I have my Y5 manifold. So instead of uh, R6, I have my cone of Y5. So in general, this is not going to be something as simple as R6 or C3. But I know already something about this uh, cone over Y5. First of all, I know it's a Calabiao, um, so it has some special properties. And also I know it, it has to be a cone, which comes from the, from the conformal symmetry. So in fact, uh, it, it's, an, it's a known, it's a known uh, fact, it was known in the mathematics for a long time, that quite in general, whenever you take uh, the cone over Sasaki-Einstein manifold, you get a Calabiao cone and vice versa. From any Calabiao cone, you get uh, on the base, on this cone, exactly as a Sasaki-Einstein manifold. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence with these two, and sometimes one really think, talks about one or the other interchangeably. Right. So uh, the conclusion is that the Sasaki Einstein manifold is really the base of this cone, and I can I can simply replace this here. Um, I will still preserve supersymmetry because I'm still obeying this equation here that the D3 brain in flat space was obeying. Something that you should have checked or you should check at some point, uh, which means in particular that this function is not changed. So I don't have to do anything to this. In fact, there was nothing really that uh, we could suspect was depending on, uh, on R6. It was also only using the fact that it was a harmonic function in the transverse space. Uh, but once you write the Laplacian in polar coordinates and you assume that the harmonic function depends only on the radial coordinate, then it, it's completely relevant what sits into here. Uh, and so this, uh, this gives you the function a, H unchanged. So that means that if we take the near horizon limit of this, of this configuration. Oh, okay. <coughs> um, is there anything I have to change here? Not really. So that, that's, that's, a, that's the end of this. So if we take the near horizon limit now by dropping this one, taking alpha prime to zero, blah, 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 etc., then we are exactly back to the ADS5 times Y5 solution. And this is then the brain picture for, for where this solution comes from in the near horizon. So it's a stack of the three brains and uh, sitting at the apex of a, of a cone, which is a cone over a Sasaki Einstein manifold. Now, differently from the cone over S5, the cone over a generic Y5 is singular here. So this is singular. There is a point, just a point. It's a, it's a conical singularity. So it is singular, but um, exactly as we were discussing in the case of the finite temperature, this singularity is not, not detected by curvature invariants. So if you compute any curvature invariant, it will be well behaved, finite. Um, so this does not tell you about this particular singularity. The singularity has to come with the fact that there is some, some kind of uh, angular, but it's an angular thing in, in, uh, in the full five dimensions, deficit, which is exactly analogous to, to when we were doing finite temperature, that uh, instead of going around to pi, then you could have a conical singularity unless 
we were then closing this by uh, in, uh, requiring a particular value for, the, for this uh, periodicity. We don't have this, this uh, possibility here. We can't do anything to fix this. So we have to live with that. It's a, sing it's a conical singularity which uh, I cannot change. Because the periodi periodicities on this five-dimensional manifold, uh, differently from the periodicity on a circle, cannot be changed. So the periodicity of the circle by its own, it's an arbitrary constant. You can take whatever you want. Uh, but the periodicities of the, of, of the angular coordinates here, you cannot change because that would screw up the, the topology or, or the, the, um, essentially the, uh, the non-singularity of the space itself. Okay. So, well, if you combine what I said there with what, what I said here, uh, these are also called Calabi-Yau singularities. Now, all of this is not just nomenclature and tautological, just the labeling of what we have found, but there is a huge advantage and a huge progress by recognizing that this is a Calabi-Yau singularity. The reason is that these guys have a completely different description in terms of algebraic geometry. So we go in the direction of algebraic geometry. I, I picked this pink chalk, but now I have to stick with this in this board. I don't want to mix it up. Um, so I already alluded before to the fact that uh, in terms of uh, complex uh, varieties, R6 is best, is best thought as uh, C3. But in general, algebraic varieties are hypersurfaces in some Cn with some power which has to be determined. Right? So these are hypersurfaces in some C to some power, let's call it M with appropriate power. This is a bit of a degenerate case because there is no, no equation to be imposed. You just start from C3 and you don't impose any equation. But in general, you can start from some higher C. Actually, I will present one example where you can start with C4. And then you impose one equation in that case and then you're back to some three complex dimensional variety with a conical singularity. And this is hugely helpful in order to determine the field theory. So it gives really, it, 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 it essentially completely determines, once you know the algebraic, uh, um, geometric, ge algebraic ge geometric description of the singularity, that via some um, various uh, tools and maps fixes what is the field theory. So it becomes almost a machine when you plug in your singularity and you get your uh, field theory out of it. Well, we, are not, we don't have such advanced knowledge in this lecture course, so I, I could not implement this, but I can give you some hints of how this works in general by focusing on the particular example. Okay, so again, let's try to recap what, he, what we, are, uh, we are learning. The previous recap, we learned that the field theory dual to ADS5 times Sasaki Einstein manifold has to be an unequal one super conformal field theory. But now we have learned a little bit more. So, what we did we learn? So, we learned some. Uh, this is not, not working. So, some, some important, some key let's say constraints on uh, our n equal one as CFT. Okay, so it comes, the, 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 most, imp the most important novelty is that it comes from 
and the three brains. So that's an important uh, piece of information. And then if you go back to my short discussion of the theory on the three brains and your uh, sphincter lectures at this uh, school, then this implies that it is a Young-Mills theory. Mills theory, right? Because this is what lives on the three brains. So unless we do, do this something extremely dramatic and bad, uh, we will have young Mills field around. And because everything is done by carefully keeping track of supersymmetry, I can say safely that this is going to be a super young Mills theory, whatever this is. Now, we know it's conformal, it has to be a conformal field theory. So let's see, can it be pure super young Mills? No, because that's not a conformal field theory. Okay, so um, what are the conformal field theories which have young Mills field in four dimensions? Well, uh, we have n equal four. Can it be n equal four? No, it cannot be n equal four because it has n equal, equal, n equal one. So it has to be something in between. So it has to be a young Mills theory uh, but presumably, uh, it has to contain some kind of matter to make it conformal. So let's say super young Mills with, should not say plus, so with uh, m some matter. Now this word matter can be, can be made very precise in a second. So this matter in general in young Mills theory transforms in um, in representation of the gauge group. G I will call the gauge group. And and two though it's basically the continuation of the, of the same item there. So, since we have n equal one supersymmetry, uh, then the multiplets and uh, the Lagrangian, so the interactions, Uh, are have determined have a fixed in the sense that it's completely determined by supersymmetry determining structure. So this part I I kind of uh, b believe that you have seen in, in the lecture course by Ali Pomoni, but um, I will uh, nevertheless recall the main feature of that. So we are taking the strategy of narrowing down. It's like in this gain, guess who, right? You have many faces and then you start, you knock them down until in the end there remain only two or three and finally only one. So we are through this process. We mentioned this already, but let's recall it. Uh, has so this is kind of using the brain part. This is kind of using the supersymmetry part, and then the if also let's not forget that it has ADS five dual. Okay, so uh, it implies that it, it will going to be CFT. So he, here this is emphasizing the fact that it must have a conformal fixed point. So let's start uh, essentially from the middle. Oh, point one and two are, tight, uh, are, are closely related. So the multiplets are the vector multiplet, which uh, in components 
which is what you get in the Vestumina gauge. If you're using Superfield, that probably was explained in this, in this school. You have a bunch of uh, gauge field transforming in the adjoint of a, of a given gauge group that so far we don't really know. And then in the same multiplet, you have some fermions. And then in the same multiplet, you have some uh, scalars, which are traditionally called D in an irreasonable book. And all are transforming in the adjoint representation. So this index is an index of the adjoint. So you have to sum these guys, as usual, over the generators of the adjoint to, to have expressions that uh, are written in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, abstract notation. Right. And the other multiplet that you can have is the chiral multiplet, which then um, is, a, is a scalar in the, so, so it's a, it has a scalar in the, in the lowest component and it has a, a fermions traditionally called a, a psi and then it has another auxiliary field called F. So uh, this is in a joint of G, and this is in some R representation of G. Okay. So the most typical example that we learn in uh, in standard model physics is our, our uh, fields transforming in the fundamental, but we know that there are also fields transforming. The adjoint, these are the fields in unequal four, for example, they all transform in the adjoint. Uh, there are also different representations, and, and we'll see that one, one uh, kind of a hybrid representation of these two uh, appears quite naturally in this context. So they will have some index, which sometimes I'm, I can suppress, and this will be the index of the representation, right? So depending on which representation there are, the index uh, will, will act in some different ways. Um, let, let's use this board to write the Lagrangian. So any supersymmetric Lagrangian then must have these fields here in some interaction, in some combination. Now any reasonable Lagrangian must have kinetic terms for the dynamical fields. So we'll have kinetic term for A, lambda, phi and psi, and then they will have some potential terms for the auxiliary fields F and D. And in, so in formula, any reasonable Lagrangian will contain terms like one quarter trace F mu nu, F mu nu, and covariant derivative of mu phi dagger D uh, mu phi here, oh, I forgot to say that, of course, the, uh, well, uh, as usual, the, the field there is real, but this chiral field is complex. So every, every entry here is complex. So that's why you have to put the dagger here. So this is the kinetic part of the Lagrangian, and then there is a, the auxiliary part, which takes this form, and there are terms with fermions, which I'm not bothered to write. Okay, terms with fermions means that there will be fermions and also terms with, with fermions and bosons together. So think of a Lagrangian, put the fermions to zero, and, and this is what, you, what remains. So that's what I meant when I said that n equal one supersymmetry is very constrained and the Lagrangian is fixed uniquely. So in this sense, the Lagrangian is fixed uniquely. All you have to do now is to specify what is the gauge group and what is the representation in which the chiral fields transform. Well, plus one additional, one additional um, thing, which is the superpotential. How does the superpotential arise? So the superpotential arises in the following, one, one way to see it, that you have to impose the, super, uh, the um, if you integrate out 
the auxiliary field F I in D A, then uh, these are related to the dynamical field uh, in this way. So this comes through the derivative of a superpotential phi, uh, which is a holomorphic function. So the bosonic part is a holomorphic function of the of the scalar components of this multiplet. So it depends only on phi, not on phi bars, and so on. These are called F terms for obvious reason. And when you integrate the, the D, then you get the D terms. And the D terms look like phi dagger I, T A I J, phi J, where T is the generator of the adjoint representation of the gauge group. And these are called D terms. So when you come here, then the potential of the, of the Lagrangian, the bosonic part of the potential, once you eliminate the auxiliary field, then looks like sum over F I, uh, well, this is already, okay. Let, let, okay, let's not, <laughs> let's, not, uh, let's not actually do it. Um, this is now viewed, let's say, uh, as a as a function of the of the phi, right? This is the potential, and it is roughly speaking the square of the derivative of the of the superpotential. So, if you are interested in finding classical solutions to this, to this Lagrangian here, and the particular classical solution that we are interested in are the constant ones. So the constant solution to the, to the equation motion of the filtered Lagrangian are by definition the vacuum moduli space, abbreviated vacuum F, F, uh, VMS. So the vacuum moduli space uh, is given by constant solution. So in particular, uh, you have to uh, make, this, make sure that this potential vanishes, and then you have, so from V equal to zero, you see that uh, you must have the D term equal to zero, and the fi equal to zero. If this is not completely convincing to you, then this is also implied by the supersymmetry condition, exactly as in supergravity, when you have d psi equal to zero and the lambda equal to zero. They, they make sure that the d term and f term equations are satisfied. Okay, so now these are equations, thanks to uh, these two conditions there, which are equations on the phi and phi bar. And it is a general result, a general theorem, which is known that uh, the space, so the vacuum, modu mo vacuum modular space, uh, well here let me add the supersymmetric vacuum modular space, of, of any n equal one field theory is a Kähler variety. So I use this word variety because it's not a compact manifold in general. It, it's a non-compact uh, variety. So this is in general. So in some cases, it can be, with some particular condition, a Calabi-Yau one. Notice that here, the number of fields can be arbitrarily high. So 
these varieties here can have arbitrary high dimension. There's nothing to do with space-time dimension. And indeed, you can have Calabiao varieties as moduli space of some supersymmetric field theory, which is some Calabiao in dimension, I don't know, 12 or something. So uh, there is no, nothing that fixes the, the dimension to be the physical one of interest for us, which is three. So that's yet an extra set of conditions that will, uh, that if they happen, and then they do in, in many cases, and to some extent one can write down what are the necessary conditions for this to be the case, given, given a Lagrangian with a particular gauge group and superpotential. So there is a class of gauge groups and superpotentials such that uh, that we have as vacuum modular space a Calabiao threefold. And this for us closes the circle somehow because we started from Sasaki Einstein, we went to the cone, it's a Calabiao, we know this is supersymmetric field theory. Supersymmetric field theory is going to have a, a Calabiao variety as a, as a mo vacuum modular space. And uh, well, the physical link is that you can think of this variety as the modular space of the brain moving transverse. Uh, to them, I mean, moving parallel to themselves and exploring the singularity itself. So, on top of supersymmetry given to us the generic form, we get some constraint, which are not tremendously easy to kind of uh, put it down in terms of simple formula, such that uh, the superpotential and uh, the gauge group will be such that they give a Calabiao threefold. So this narrows them down, and so we keep knocking down these uh, um, faces on this game. But there's still many possible culprits, so we still have to find <laughs> at the end which is the culprit. So now, because, I, because it's the last lecture, so we don't have uh, a second chance. So let's see if I can finish this in one hour. Yeah, okay, let's make a break then. Okay, before we continue, um, one question from one of you made me realize that I said something just slightly wrong, but uh, I'm sure no one, oh, maybe someone noticed, but a killing vector implies that the magic can be written in this form, where here there is a function in general. So this is back to the definition of the Sasaki Einstein. And uh, actually for Sasaki Einstein, uh, it's, a, it's a short computation to show that F uh, is constant. So this is just correcting uh, a statement which I made. It does not change anything substantially. Okay, let's continue here. So in n equal one field theory, we want it to be a gauge theory. So we want to have it some vector multiplet transforming some gauge group. So we need to say what is G, the gauge group. We need to say what is the representation in which the chiral fields transform. And we need to say also what is the superpotential. So that fixes uh, completely the field theory. And as I said, I will not kind of derive uh, what are the general constraints, but I will, uh, I will make examples that lead to Calabiao threefold singularities. So the typical example, uh, G is a product of groups of SUN with some uh, integer number, chi, some, some power, right? So factors, these are called gauge group factors. So you can have, uh, in the simplest case, which is S5, you have SUN, so this is equal to one. But then you can have SUN cross SUN or SUN cross SUN cross SUN, blah, 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 up to some numbers. You can also change the ranks here uh, in, some, in some cases, but um, generically 
you, you have uh, only one, uh, one N that appears. Um, and all of these, so if you have various factors, right, although I said there is a gauge, one gauge group, but if you have factors, then you have uh, as many young mills coupling as the number of factors, because in the Lagrangian, you can have a young mills coupling for one factor of trace, F you knew, F you knew, then the other one, and so on and so on. So with different G square young mills. So the typical form of the superpotential is then some uh, sum of monomials, where each monomial is um, is the product of the number of chiral fields. So the typical form is some uh, this is schematic. So, uh, but it's, it's basically completely correct. Number of terms. H K and then some products of some phi j, right? So importantly, I wanted to mention that these are additional coupling constants. So the couplings in the typical example are young mills couplings to the fact associated to the factor of the SUN and uh, couplings associated to the monomials of the superpotential. Actually, one thing which I didn't write in my notes, but I should say uh, on this board, is that the representation in which the chiral fields transform is typically some bifundamental, right? So that transform a chiral field phi transform as a fundamental of some factor here, you pick one, and anti-fundamental of the other factor. So these are called bifundamental. As I said, that neither are joints nor fundamental themselves, but roughly speaking, they look a bit like our joints in the sense that they have uh, n square degrees of freedom. So you can characterize by them by uh, an n by nine matrix as well. Um, no, 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 it's not cubic in general. It can be any... Uh, um, is, is that a problem? Is it what? Yeah, in, okay, you're, you're raising an actually an important point that um, the theory that we are going to, I mean, actually I was going to address this <laughs> in, the, in the next board, but uh, in, anticipation of, in anticip anticipation of that, so far we have imposed only supersymmetry. Now we want to impose conformal invariance. So an immediate objection that was made is that if you have couplings which, are, uh, which break conformal invariance uh, um, manifestly because they introduce mass scales, then uh, how are you going to have a conformal invariance? And the thing is that the Lagrangian description that we give here is a UV description exactly in this, as in the sense of the uh, lectures in CFT that you have seen. So the Lagrangian is always describing something up here. And we are interested in going somewhere down here in the infrared where there is a fixed, oh, arrows goes all in the same direction, where there is a fixed point, right? So, um, this is a UV description that could be different ones, as has been explained extensively and so on, uh, but it's a, it's a convenient UV descri description because it's given in terms of explicit fields and Lagrangian. Uh, but now we have to make sure that uh, actually this happens and we flow to a conformal fixed point, and this is possible. Uh, this should answer, I think, this question. Yeah. 
no, it's not the case. So, <laughs> uh, the, yeah, we can discuss that. Uh, I'm sure on for hours on Skype in the in the near future. <laughs> but um, really, there are there are there are um, as far as I remember uh, higher powers. But okay, I will not put my life in that. It's, it's done on the UV, and somehow, uh, well, uh, how, how to say, um, no, I mean, it, yeah, yeah, it's more, yeah. Uh, the description is done in terms of fields which are in the UV Lagrangian. So from this point of view, it's done using UV variables. Uh, but then um, the correct description is done in terms of gauge invariant monomials is, is done in terms of chiral ring, etc., which is then something which survives and it remains true in the infrared. So um, I, I'm making the story much shorter than what, what, what uh, it should be in reality. Um, so I'm going to argue, I'm going to exemplify my discussion by saying that uh, we, we obtain some information by looking at the, uh, the, vo the vacuum modular space, which is obtained from the, this, the scale of field phi, of the chiral fields, but those are not gauge invariant objects, gauge, gauge invariant operators. So, strictly speaking, the information that they give would not be exactly uh, the information that we, we, we see in the dual gravity side, but it turns out that uh, the vacuum modular space can also be um, the same vacuum modular space that is obtained naively from these variables is also re reconstructed by considering um, all this, the uh, gauge invariant operators of a certain type wh which, th which the TU admits. So these are back to our kind of primary operators, uh, in particular the Masonic type, uh, there is some particular name for that. So, th yeah, this is a sh short shortcut, um, but it's exactly the same shortcut that was used by Klavanov and Witten, more or less. I mean, they, 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 they gave a bit more information, but they certainly did not talk about uh, kaluza klein spectra in that paper. But later, this was, was uh, un understood better. Um, so, back to the question of the powers, would you be happy or unhappy with the quartic superpotential? Okay, good. Th then, then we are in business because Clavin and Witten has a quartic superpotential. So, so we, we are forced to talk about that. So we can, we can write that on the board and, and discuss it. <laughs> so actually, I do bet my life that there are examples. <laughs> I'm going to discuss one next. Um, fine. So, well, this is the part which is uh, obviously, as various people in the audience have noticed, the most delicate one, perhaps, the most subtle. Um, and there is always this tension about saying that the Lagrangian of uh, whatever theory I'm, I'm considering is dual to a certain ADS5 fixed point. Uh, this is an abu abuse of notation. It's a UV description for a theory that in the infrared is going to flow to a conformal fixed point with conformal invariance. So it is a longer, so, but th this sometimes is uh, shortened in this, in this uh, shorter uh, form of the conjecture. So, well, exactly, conformal invariance. How do I impose conformal invariance? I guess it has been explained, I suppose, that uh, you're getting conformal invariance if um, quantum mechanically the beta function of your theory vanishes and for n equal 4 it's a, it's a spectacular case of this, uh, of this situation where the beta function is exactly 0 uh, um, in, in a space of a, in, in, in such a, in a kind of a surface so there is a manifold of uh, mar marginal deformations of the theory and it's exactly uh, 0. In general, back to our 
uh, more elementary QFT notions, we know that computing beta functions is a very hard task, and you know we have to struggle really a lot to compute one one loop beta function of something, uh, like days of computations, checking the factors, and so on. So l l let alone going to two loops, three loops, etc. So this seems to be now a problem because we we want to check something which is at very strong coupling. Remember, lambda much bigger than one, plus also n equal to infinity. And uh, so how, I mean, how am I going to compute the beta function? Luckily, and for those of you who know, that won't be a surprise, but uh, it is a known result, a very nice result, that the beta function for n equal one field theories um, can be computed exactly. So there is an exact beta function. You don't have to compute any loop if you <laughs> exact beta functions. due to a bunch of Russians. So sometimes it's known as Russian beta function. Novikov and et al. Okay. And this has been then also studied, I think, by, by various people also in the, in the Western world, etc. So we take uh, advantage of, of these very powerful results. And this has to do with holomorphy, holomorphicity in n-equal one field theories in four dimensions and so on. It means that given a particular gauge um, coupling, then we can read off what is the exact beta function just from, uh, from essentially the, the representation of the matter which enters into, into this, uh, that couples to that beta function, to the coupling of which we are computing the beta function. So uh, which couplings do we have? We have the Young mills coupling and we have these uh, couplings. So the statement here, I'm going to well give it already the simplifi simplified version, is that if we impose the beta function vanishing of uh, uh, each particular, each Young mills coupling, then you get formulas of this type, zero equal to one minus sum over i, one minus ri. Okay, so here I, I, I made a, f a few number of non-trivial steps. What are these i's? So these are the uh, chiral fields. Charged under uh, the uh, gauge factor. E, I. Right, so here, this is um, some mu d by d mu, some one over g square, yam mills, small i, right? And then <coughs> coupled to these yam mill fields, there will be some uh, uh, chiral fields, those that have a non vanishing transformation rule under under that particular gauge factor. And they all participate to the beta function. So this is not the beta function. The beta function is proportional to this, but since it has to be zero, then, uh, then this has to be zero. But this is essentially imposes a constraint on the R charges of the chiral field uh, at a particular uh, gauge factor. And there are as many of these constraints as number of young mills coupling. And then there is also a similar one for uh, superpotential. So here from the H, K, so you have B, K equals zero. Then, so this implies, implies that uh, sum over I, R, I minus two is equal to zero. And uh, in this case, this sum is over the chirals that participate to the monomial. <coughs> right? So in to each of these monomials, there, there are a number of fields. Not necessarily all of the fields of the theory will participate. And uh, so this 
the, the R charge is fixed by, by this equality here. The sum of the R charges has to be equal to two. Okay, so there are a number of, uh, of constraints. So these are constraints on the R charges, which then, which are of course uh, related to the conformal dimension through this formula. So for, so the chiral fields, the chiral superfields, and, and for which the scalar are some chiral fields, there are also um, chiral primaries in the sense of conformal field theory. So their, their dimension at the fixed point is related to the R charge like that. So here chiral means in various slightly different but, but similar things. So we actually never talk about, in these situations, we never talk about scaling dimensions. I will almost never write delta of anything, but I will always talk about R charges, which I denote as R, right? So Ri is the R charge, uh, let me say in, in words, R charge of phi I, okay? So the first, uh, um, right, one first guess is that if you write all of these equations, we we'll just fix for us uniquely all these R. Oh, sorry, here I used a different notation, but it's stupid. Right, so all of these equations, if they all fix the R charges, then um, we, can, we could anticipate that uh, everything about this, the solution, is, um, about the field theory, that we want to know is known, and we can start comparing with our gravitational dual. Um, there is a important and very nice subtlety, which I, I will highlight at the very end of the, of the lecture today, that actually these equations, in general, do not fix all these R charges. So they kind of define some space, in the space of R charges of the fields, uh, which has a number of uh, free parameters, uh, which is typically quite low, so it's either one or two, let's say, or three or something, some, some low number, but it's not uniquely determined. So we still need to do something, and, and this is, um, well, this goes directly to the work that leads to A maximization. Now, to, to explain what is this A maximization, rather than now opening a parenthesis, I will just postpone this and come back to this in the example that I'm going to consider. So it's a procedure uh, devised by Interligator and VACT 2004 that allows to fix the R charges and therefore uh, all the properties of a, all the important properties of a conformal field theory by uh, solving a relatively simple ext extremization problem. So you have to extremize a function and this function will be a function of the free parameters imposed by that, and that will fix uniquely all the R charges, and that will fix uniquely, uh, essentially, the point, the infrared point where we are landing. Okay, so this is A maximization. Uh, so I'm just mentioning this as appetizer. So this leads to And by the time we arrive at talking about, uh, about talking about this, we will have all the ingredients in hand to appreciate what this procedure really is. So in this last half an hour, or maybe slightly a little bit more, just to try and finish everything I wanted to say, uh, we will consider kind of run through most of uh, this preparation for the particular case of the Klebano witten model. So Klebano and Witten wrote a quite famous paper in 1998 where they um, proposed that a given Sasaki-Einstein manifold, which was known, so they have not actually found the metric, is dual to a field theory that they have written down. So they have proposed that model um, and then gave really a lot of evidence, I mean, which goes far beyond uh, what I've discussed today. 
uh, including some uh, discrete symmetries and subtleties like that, for the fact that the duality should hold. Actually, one thing that they didn't discuss is the matching, the most important matching, which is the matching of the volume of the manifold to the central charge A, but I will do that. So I will fill that little gap. So this is the, uh, the first and simplest example of ADS5 times Sasaki-Einstein 5, dual to an n equal 1 um, supersymmetric, let's say, symmetric QFT or gauge theory, well, Young-Mills plus matter flowing to a CFT. So that just to make the statement a little bit more precise than just saying dual to a CFT. Okay, so let's go back and be very concrete. So from now on, we will be very concrete with the formula. Uh, the metric. The metric had the name, which remained in the literature. It's called T11 for reasons that, that do not interest us. And uh, in terms of my notation, the, the four-dimensional base, the four-dimensional Einstein metric, is an Einstein metric on the product of two, two spheres. So there is one with uh, theta one and phi one replaced with theta two and phi two. And uh, there is this part of the universal killing vector which is written in some uh, convenient normalizations like this. Okay. Small uh, pearl to take away as a small lesson. If I give you a metric, I really have not given you very much. I have to tell you a little bit more about uh, this metric in order to appreciate what this space is. And what is more is the um, range of the coordinates. So, okay, so phi one and phi two belong to zero and two pi. Psi belongs to zero and four pi. And uh, theta one and theta two are in zero and pi. Okay, so now we know everything about the space. So in particular, from here, we know that in addition to the universal killing vector, which is dual to the U1R symmetry, there is some extra symmetry. So we have some SO4, which SU2 cross SU2 isometry which sometimes are we, re are we refer to as SU2-1 and SU2-2, rotating these two, two spheres. So I can do, I can do um, now an exercise together with you. Actually, you can do it on your, on your notebooks while I talk. Compute the volume. So. Let's see if anyone computes it before I write it. <laughs> so the volume of T11 is given by 1 over 6 square times third. Which these are these factors here of the field band. And then integral 0 and 2 pi d phi 1 square and also integral between zero and pi of sine theta one d theta one square and finally the integral in d um, psi between zero and four pi okay so putting the factors in you get 16 over 27 pi cube 
right? So we learned that the volume of T11 is 16 over 27, the volume of S5. Remember, at some point I was writing pi cube and saying, notice this is the volume of S5. Moreover, the cone over T11 in my previous notation has also a name that was uh, studied before then, Clevano and Witten, and it was called conifold. And in terms of my algebraic geometry, uh, it's a hyp one equation, so it's a hypersurface which is defined by one equation in C4. And the one equation is, has various presentations. In one way, it looks like this. And obviously, the reason why this is not a point is that the z variables are complex numbers, complex variables. And obviously, it's, it's, uh, these are two real equations, so it's something which has six real dimensions or three complex dimension. And also, one question which was, oh, what is, the, what is the physical interpretation of the conical singularity? Well, you can see this from here, that at least there is a conical singularity. It is a singularity, and there is a conical symmetry, which is, if you multiply the z, um, zi with some complex number t, then this is still a solution. So, in fact, you can rescale the, the, um, the z by an arbitrary number going um, arbitrary close to zero. So t here is a c star variable. So there is a, in, in complex geometry sense, it's a, it's a complex cone. Um, but also the real section of that is a real cone, as, a, as we were discussing before. Also, this notation here highlights the, uh, so this, highlights the SO4 symmetry. So evident the SO4 as the ZI transform in the fundamental of this SO4. Actually, in order to understand or mm, help understanding what is going to be our field theory dual, uh, there is a better, well, there is an alternative presentation of this uh, singularity, of this conifold singularity, which also uh, is often found in, in the literature, which is in terms of some variables which are called z tilde, which I really leave to you to check as an exercise that it's equivalent to the one there. These are also variable in C4. And uh, as Klavanov and Witten explained, one can solve for these variables in terms of four other variables, which they call A1, B1, uh, A2, B2, uh, and then uh, the other two in different combinations of the same four variables. A1, B2, Z4 is A2, B1. Okay. So this A1, B1, B A2, B2, there are another four complex variables, just, just uh, complex variables in C4. Notice that once you have solved in this way, you have this symmetry that AI uh, is equivalent to lambda AI and uh, BI is equivalent to lambda to the minus one BI, where lambda is again a C star variable. So the C star number here has a real part and a phase. And one can choose the real part in a particular way in order to impose one condition, right? So the one condition that one can impose is that the sum of the modular square of these variables is equal to zero. Uh, 
And then it remains the phase, so if, if uh, using Klebanov with the notation, is, this is S times E to the I alpha, then the symmetry still needs to be imposed because uh, you remember you have to solve this equation here in the end. So you have to impose this symmetry, namely you have to take uh, a quotient with um, A1 or AI uh, identified with e to the i alpha, where alpha is a real number, um, ai, and bi is identified e to the minus i alpha, bi. So let's leave the, the volume of T11 up here. So the claim is that this way of writing the hypersurface is equivalent to the other one. Uh, and this other way uh, has a, a name, is a particular um, uh, type of quotient which is called Kähler quotient. Kähler quotient. Right? And it's denoted uh, with a double line. So it's a Kähler quotient of C4. So here the C4 variables are A1, A2, B1, B2. And then you quotient this, and this l double line means that we're imposing this equation and these two identifications here. And you see that there is a correlation between these signs and the signs here. So you have to give only a set of um, numbers, which are called charges the, of the Kähler quotient. So uh, the charges are often written in a, in a row, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. Okay, so this is true in general for, for, a, for a Kähler quotient that you can take of some Cn with a U1 or you can actually also have a higher powers of U1. Uh, um, but here there is also something in addition which uh, we knew from the very beginning, the SO4 symmetry. So the F SO4 symmetry still remains because now in this notation you have an SU2 symmetry acting on A1, A2 and an SU2 symmetry acting on B1, B2 and in fact A1, AI uh, transforms in the fundamental of SU2, 1 say and uh, as a, a, a does not transform in the other SU2 and BI transform in the fundamental of SU2, 2. Okay, so this is our all uh, maths, and now the physics that goes into the direction of uh, getting some field theory is in the cunning observation of Klebanov and Witten that you can view this quotient here as uh, the vacuum moduli space of an unequal one field theory. where in particular, this is a D term. These are uh, equivalences under gauge transformations. And um, uh, okay, there is no F term. So why? The reason there is no F term is that it can be introduced uh, at the next stage. Um, and this becomes clear once we uh, declare that the gauge theory of interest is u1 cross u1, let's say u1, 1, u1, 2. And the charges of the, of the bifundamental are uh, exactly 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. So at this level, this looks like in this uh, diagrammatic notation, which are called quiver, something like that. A, I, B, J. So these arrows uh, stand for the, for example, the fact that this A has charge one under this first factor, U11, one, one, and charge uh, minus one under the other factors, U12, and vice versa for the B. So there is a D term uh, in general, uh, which is exactly this, and these are the gauge transformation. So, well, this is kind of uh, interesting, but uh, it's still not fulfilling the, the full bill because 
with an abelian theory, how is it going to be to related to any large n? Uh, well, that the typical situation is that we have a young Mills theory, and in, in addition, uh, young Mills of some SUN, uh, where n is infinite. So this is completely here uh, oblivious to that. And the trick is that they say two things at the same time. They say, well, now we are going to say we promote this, or we either actually exchange this for SUN factors, And at the same time, we introduce a superpotential that was zero before, so before there was no superpotential, no F terms, but now they introduce it. And because they also want to respect this SU2 cross SU2 of this um, AI and BI, then they, there is a unique way to write the superpotential which um, respects this symmetry. So it's a trace because these are now matrices of SUN uh, one and SUN two, um, AI, BJ, BK, AJ, B, uh, IJ, uh, L. Now, if you think of in the special case, uh, just for curiosity, for example, that instead you have a, a, a U, U, um, U1 here, you will find that um, this is actually zero because everything commutes. So you have to expand and start finding terms like A1, B1, A2, B2, and this becomes clear. One, these are just the epsilon symbol, anti-symmetric symbol in, in IJ, KM. So effectively, this, su this superpotential, which uh, is completely determined by requiring that it respects the global symmetry SU2 close SU2, effectively, um, makes uh, the A, I, and B, I abelian on, on the vacuum modular space, right? So once uh, you impose the F term, you can check, impose the F term condition from this. Now these are non-abelian F terms because they transform in some uh, uh, bifundamental. Uh, but you will find that the, the, what this imposes is that actually uh, this A and B uh, commute. So on the vacuum modular space, they commute. They can, you can therefore diagonalize them simultaneously, and you're back exactly to a number, namely n bunch of uh, U1s on, on which you have to impose the D term. So this, in fact, gives the Calabi-Yau trifold as, uh, as a moduli space, but strictly speaking, in fact, gives uh, the Calabi-Yau threefold to the power n. So you have like n copies of this Calabi-Yau threefold, all of them independently, and you have to actually symmetrize over all of them. So this sometimes is, is written as symmetric product n of a uh, uh, con uh, well, conifold. Okay, this is the vacuum modular space of this theory that Klebanov and Witten came came up with. So now that's the quiver diagram and now we forget about, about this U1. We really forget about the U1. But as I hope this has uh, helped you appreciating, although these theories are always large N theories, actually the, the abelian theories, they contain a lot of information about, uh, about uh, the, uh, the duality itself. So uh, although it looks stupid to set n equal one in, in this case and in similar ones, one does learn things about the theory in the, in the abelian case. But this is, the, this is the field theory. Quiver plus superpotential, that's the field theory. We can now forget everything about conifolds and all that uh, stuff. And, and go through, through our checklist, right? So we want to see that this field theory, first of all, flows to a conformal fixed point, and second of all, that it has a, a, a R charges and central charges compatible with those that you compute from T11 in the gravity side. So, 
So now, in this kind of a formal uh, method that I gave you, um, that looked a bit complicated and, and confusing, now we can go through that uh, uh, step by step, because now the young milk, cu young milk coupling are two, only two, right, so the G1 and G2, associated to these gauge factors, and then there is only, of the is HK, there is only one, which is called lambda. So there are three couplings. And therefore, it means we have to impose three equations, right? And therefore, uh, I said that in the lucky case, we that would fix uniquely the R charges. So let's try that. Well, I will have to be a little bit quick because uh, we are really running out of time. But... Uh, um, I can I can write it. So if we write the beta function associated to gauge group one, and we impose that this is equal to zero, then we get the following equation. We get one after simplifying all the factors, and then this sum that I wrote that you can co compare with your notes of uh, one minus r. So we had one minus r of a one plus one minus r of a two plus one minus r of b1, plus one minus r of b2. And this has to be equal to zero. So after you simplify stuff, that gives an equation which, assuming uh, something which is present, namely SU2 cross SU2 symmetry, then uh, R of A1 is the same as R of A2. They better have the same if they have to be a multiplet transforming in the, in the fundamental of SU2. So then there are only two variables. There is R of A and R of B. Okay, so R of A plus R of B, this equation implies is equal to one. However, if you now start imposing this condition here, you can see, basically you can guess it already from the fact that there is complete symmetry in the exchange of these two. You will get exactly the same condition. Mm, bad luck. And if you impose that the R charges of these four terms sum to two, you will get exactly the same condition. So you run out of luck. So you get one condition for two undetermined R charges, that the fields A and B, or rather the whatever, whatever they become in the infrared fixed point, um, have to satisfy. So uh, there is a quick um, way forward, which we adopt momentarily, and then we come back to this uh, at, the, at the very end. So the quick way, way forward is to say, let's assume that there is a Z2 symmetry. So that actually, because I can exchange A and B, actually I can exchange these two, so they should actually be equal. So if that is assumed, that fixes R, all the R's equal to one half. Okay, how much time do we uh, uh, do I have to finish I don't need more much more but uh, uh, five minutes ten minutes depend ten minutes you can do whatever you want but uh, uh, if you leave the room now and you attend any exam I will not pass you <laughs> so it's up to you <laughs> All right, now for the attentive uh, audience, something to ponder, but I will not talk about. I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave, leave this as a puzzle for you. This is below the unitarity bound. bound. Mm -hmm. Moving on. Uh, it's not a problem, so uh, there, there is no, nothing particularly deep. There is just a reason why it can be. But uh, the final entry, well, we have to do these checks. Now, the symmetries is, has been used already as a, as a hypothesis, so there is nothing to check. By construction, this has all the symmetries uh, of, the, of the gravitational side. 
The Calusa Klein spectrum they hold, but well, they, we cannot discuss that in five minutes. So the only thing that we can discuss in five minutes is the vinyl anomaly. So this is the last thing that we are going to do in these lectures. And uh, then I can write some uh, formula, which I have to pull from my hat, but I can, I can roughly uh, tell you where they come from. And the formula relates the central charges A and C, which I discussed uh, in my previous lectures, to some traces of R charges. And these traces, which I'm going to say exactly what they mean, let me tell you where they come from. So these traces are obtained from um, anomalies. So the, these are Toft anomaly coefficients. And for example, the cubic one comes from uh, triangle anomalies, right? three currents. And the reason why the anomalies of the R symmetry current has anything to do with the anomaly of the, of the vial um, transformation is that because in n equal one, they actually sit in the same multiplet. So supersymmetry relates the uh, anomalies in the U1 current to the anomaly in the conformal transformation. And as a result, after some uh, computations, one ends up with this uh, very useful formula that uh, give these anomalies A and C in terms of these traces, which can be computed uh, trivially once you know your Lag the Lagrangian and once you know the R charges of the field. Because, for example, trace of some power alpha, where alpha is one or three, is given by the sum of all the R charges of all the fermions, right? And uh, of course, they have to be the fermions because those are the guys that give rise to the anomaly. Um, so we have here R i minus one, where the minus one uh, is put there because these are fermions. And the, by definition, the R i is the R charge of the scalar field in the chiral multiplet. Okay, so once I know which are my fields, in this case they are A1, A2, B1, and B2. And once I know what are the, the R charges are, and in this case they are all one half, which makes my life very easy, then I can compute all of these guys. I leave the volume there, which I'm going to recover in, in a second. So I can compute trace R, right? So trace R is given by, um, it's linear, so you have, um, everything is going to be a factor of n square because there are n squared uh, in, the, in the adjoint, in the bifundamental. So there are n squared of these uh, uh, degrees of freedom. And, um, and then uh, I have to take the R of the chiral fields, which is one half minus one. Um, and there are four of them. And then there are also some other secret fermions which I've not mentioned for a while namely uh, the gay genos, the lambdas, right? So these are comes from the super partners of the scalars phi, and there are some which come from the super partners of the gay genos. And these guys, they have R equal to one, uh, simply because they are part of the, of the vector multiplet, and, uh, and so their, their dimension is completely, their R charge is completely fixed. There is nothing there um, to understand. Um, how many of those there are, but well, there is one for one SUN factor and there is another one for the other SUN factor. So you get, I get here two. So I'm not looking at my notes and hopefully I'm not making mistakes. Um, so what do we get? So we get uh, zero. Yes. Okay, fine. Right, so this is zero. And we can then compute the more interesting trace. So it's zero, which immediately implies that A is equal to C, which is a, uh, progress towards um, having verified some of the checklist. But it really remains to compute trace R cube, uh, which in a similar fashion is given by n square times half minus one cube times four plus one uh, um, cube t 
times four, times two. What is that? Uh, this is n square, and then we have uh, uh, two minus uh, uh, half, which is uh, two two third. Um, sorry, three half. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, there I have a mistake. Aha. Uh -huh. Well spots. Yeah, well. Okay, so this is uh, I don't want to do this algebra. It's too complicated for me. So this is three half. All right. So if this is three half then, and with the correction that, um, uh, I don't know your name, sorry, <laughs> that we, we have uh, heard about, we get, um, we get the factor for A. So we get that uh, A equals C is equal to um, 27 over 64. Actually, when I checked this earlier this morning, and I said, hmm, but this does not sound familiar, well, so for some reason, it's, it's not a way which typically it's discussed, but that's the correct number. And, uh, and indeed, checklist done, we get that this is equal to pi cubed divided by n square divided for volume of T11. So, last five minutes to go back to this equation and not impose Z2 symmetry. In fact, there is no reason to impose this Z2 symmetry. And uh, the fact that there are two equations, sorry, there is one equation for three couplings, G1, G2, and lambda, means that there is a, there is a surface, two-dimensional surface, which is part of so-called conformal manifold. So the modular space of uh, all the possible deformation, exactly marginal deformations, such that the theory is still conformal, right? So that means that you can take any G1, G2, and lambda, uh, such that R of A plus R of B is equal to one, corresponds to a, to a conformal, uh, field theory. So it's not a conformal fixed point, it's a conformal manifold. And in this conformal manifold, there is not such a Z2 symmetry. Right? So we don't want to impose it. So all we do is we call this X to make our calculation a little bit quicker. Uh, and then we compute again, trace R and trace, trace R cube. So we just proceed following our nose. We compute trace R. Um, so I give you the result, it's trivial we get a zero. So this is automatic for any, any x. And then trace r cube is instead given by the following number. Trace r cube is given by, um, it, it's, a, it's a, well, okay, it's a simple algebra. Let me just sketch the, the what do I have to say? So um, n square, then we get uh, one min x minus one cube times two, right? So this is for a one and a two, and then for b one and b two instead we get minus x cube, and the gaginos they just follow their own life, uh, so they don't interfere. They just get another factor of two. So at the end of the day, when you put back the factors, you get that a is equal to 27 over 16 n square x times 1 minus x. So, okay, if this is the result for the central charge, which has a one free parameter, that's definitely not going to match to the volume of T T11. But then, what do physicists do? Well, often what do they do? When you have something 
then you just extremize. So what is the minimum value of this quantity? Is there a minimum value? No, there isn't a minimum value, but there is a maximum value, okay? So this is the picture, this is uh, uh, x, no, sorry, this is x, and this is a of x, and uh, as any one of us has learned in high school, here we have a one, and here we have one half, and, and here there is a maximum. So as a function of x, which is all the possible R symmetries compatible with the vanishing of the beta function, then the A function, well, the A central charge, let's call it, it's a function of x as a maximum. And if I compute it at, at the maximum, x max is equal to one half, which implies we are back to the previous case. And indeed, if you plug back, if you evaluate the x equal to one half, then you get uh, the previous result, which is 27 over 64 and square. Right. So this wasn't just something which I've done out of desperation. It is the general principle which I have alluded to, which is known as A maximization, which means that in general, and it's a theorem, it's proof, in general, uh, whenever you have a, um, a field theory which is uh, supposed to be conformal, then a necessary condition is that the central charge of that conformal field theory is maximized uh, in the space of all the possible R symmetries. And the maximum value is identified as the central charge A of the, of the conformal field theory. So, in fact, then, uh, after extremizing, namely maximizing A, then we get complete agreement with the supergravity calculation. And, uh, and this was uh, the beginning of a nice story which unfolded uh, uh, about more than 10 years ago, where together with my collaborators, in particular, James Parks and Yao, we, uh, we proposed a geometric dual, geometric interpretation of this uh, A maximization principle in the, in the gravitational side. And not surprisingly, this, this has to do with uh, uh, somehow fixing uh, the, uh, given a certain initial data, fixing uh, the Sasaki-Einstein manifold in, in, in a given space. So I have to be very sketchy, of course. Uh, but the thing is that uh, then there is some kind of a universal matching between the CFT side. So we get a really nice uh, story at the end, which, we, which uh, wraps up, which is the beginning of the title today the uh, Sasaki-Einstein uh, n equal one CFT duality is really a chapter of the ADS-CFT correspondence. Um, so we are, we are done and I would like to mention uh, now for those of you who are uh, really interested in this topic that uh, one could um, uh, kind of uh, have analogous statement of A maximization in other dimensions, in particular in three and two dimensions. And uh, in two dimensions is known as C extremization. And uh, we have been making some nice progress on the gravitational side of that. And it so happens it was not arranged. It's just a coincidence that tomorrow there will be a paper on this, right? So we are really now coming to the present day. And with that, I finish my lecture. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>